Welcome back to the Information Security Forum podcast. We're in the studio with our friend Steve Durbin to discuss today's topic, doing business the cyber way. The traditional way of doing business over the last 200 years is becoming extinct. For businesses to adapt and thrive, they simply must adopt cyber technology. This is no longer a choice. Look at the music industry, the film industry, and transportation, all industries that have been disrupted by technology. And the common theme is that consumers have historically demanded more choice and more agency. So, Steve, I wanted to talk today about the importance of leadership in a digital age. Tell me what you think this 21st century workforce looks like. How does a company attract and retain talent in an era of the gig economy and short-term employee contracts? Yeah, there's a lot in that, isn't there? How do you go forward against that kind of backdrop? I think, first of all, you know, it, it's it's very, very challenging for, for most traditional organizations because it, it really does completely upturn the apple cart. Um, you know, some, some of the points you make about the, this, the, the digital economy, the way in which we're used to operating, the way in which we're used to working, uh, clearly that, that permeates through at the individual level and the way in which individuals then view their role in society and, and the concept of, of work. I think it's changed a lot, as, as you've highlighted there. You know, we have moved very much away from the day when an employee would would view his or her career opportunity as being within one organization that that went a number of years ago what we're now seeing i think is a demand or or a hunger for increased collaboration in terms of the way that we work that is centered around the individual so in the days of the the corporation running itself it's now about how individuals can be persuaded to work with leadership in a, in a business in order to achieve the right outcome. So from a leader's perspective, that, that changes completely the way in which you operate. Mm-hmm. So you have to move away from some of the more traditional ways of, of working into, just as an example, you know, a continuous performance environment where feedback is provided in the moment. For some organizations, that, that's a struggle. You know, transitioning across to that away from perhaps a, a fairly traditional end of year review cycle. Um, but I think that's that's just one you know very clear example. You mentioned the gig economy and, and the fact that people will choose where they're going to spend mm-hmm. certain amounts of time. That presents another challenge. And how do you integrate those? You know, from a security standpoint, it raises the issue of what access to to material do they have? How do you um, bring back this element of trust with mm-hmm. people that perhaps are only going to be with you for a short space? of time and and that requires you to perhaps behave uh, with them in a slightly different in a slightly different way all of that uh, i think presents challenges so how do you really overcome them i think that you have to be more transparent i think you have to show a general understanding of the fact that organizations today are vehicles for the use of individuals to pursue their own career aspiration what I mean by that is that, that there is a requirement for the employment contract to be very much more than something that just happens to be written down. It, it is about understanding at the outset when somebody joins an organisation what their goals, their objectives might be, mm-hmm. how those map across to, to, uh, to what it is that the organisation is trying to achieve, and then trying to ensure that over the period that they remain with the organisation that the two elements are running together in parallel. If you think about that for a moment, that that then takes us into the realm of very much more, I, I, I suppose, validation at the outset of what this code of conduct, this employment contract would look like before people will commit to it. Mm-hmm. So you do have to get into, you know, some of the specifics around um, company strategy. What are you looking for from a skill set perspective? And then relaying that to a candidate in a way that is completely open so that they can make a judgment as to whether or not they want to spend the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months or whatever it might be, helping you to achieve that overall goal. If they can, then what? why, why are they doing it? It isn't about money necessarily. Mm-hmm. It isn't about you know employment terms. It might be about... Um, a work-life balance for some. 
It might be about uh, an intellectual uh, development. Mm -hmm. It might be about a, a exposure to a different culture, a different country, um, or, or just a different technology. And so understanding all of those different component pieces are fundamental to the way in which we then engage with the people that, that we're going to be working with over that period of time. So the role of the leader in that environment is to facilitate. It's about trying to pull together the right team members so that actually you're getting the right outcome at every moment, at every stage of the organization's journey. That's quite different from the role of a leader in the past, which I, I think you know traditionally has been perhaps to, uh, to set a strategy, to, to provide some hierarchical control, to communicate with shareholders. Um, to, and, and, and some of those things haven't gone away. We still need to communicate mm -hmm. with shareholders. We still need to communicate with our customer base. But I think we do it in a slightly different, uh, different manner. And I think it, it, re it really does require some different skills from, from leadership. It, it isn't about necessarily having all the right answers. It's about how do you assemble the right people that can help you to arrive at the right answers. So you become more of a coach, mm -hmm. to, to use you know, a sporting analogy. You, you, you're really trying to pull together the best players for the, for the team so that you can get through the next few rounds knowing full well that at some point some of them will be injured so they won't be able to play. So they might leave the organization and you might have to replace them. So it's about how do you also maintain bench strength? Where are you going to get some of those people from? How do you really maintain your presence in the open market that is differentiated in a way that will mean that you can attract the right level of individual with the right skill sets? Because that's really the, the ideal. And, and the answer to that is you have to have this transparent conversation mm -hmm. with people who work mm -hmm. for you. You have to strive to get the best from them and to deliver the best to them mm -hmm. while they're at, uh, at your place of, of work so that when they decide to move on, they move on having had a rich experience that they're happy to talk about outside of it. And, mm -hmm. and so you then begin to um, attract the kinds of individuals that, that you need to build out your bench strength so that you can then put them onto the, onto the field to play the game. That's, that's really, for me anyway, the way in which the role of the leader has changed. And if you then think about that within a digital environment, that provides the check and balance. Because people will talk about their work experience on social media. Mm -hmm. And so there is no room to hide <laughs> from a leadership standpoint. Right. Because you'll be judged every minute of the day. Right. And for some people, that will be uncomfortable. For others, um, I, I think it's more of an opportunity to finely tune skills, hone skills, understand how you need to adapt and change those skills to really get the best from people. I mean, I'm a firm believer that organizations going forward will be, and this is quite interesting when we talk about things like artificial, artificial intelligence uh, and, and the role of technology, fundamentally, even with all of those things in place, organizations will increasingly be become more dependent on people. Mm -hmm. The transactional nature of employment remains the same, but there's a lot more reciprocity, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, um, you know, the, 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 the reciprocity is, is fundamental. If you're not getting reciprocity, then you speed up the transaction mm -hmm. because people will move on. Mm -hmm. and, th and there isn't very much you can do to, to retain them in, in that kind of environment. Um, because, you know, we do work in a, in a competitive environment. Particularly if you look at security, for instance, it's hugely competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and what people are looking to do is continually add to their skill sets so that they can move on and do more interesting work whatever, in whatever field that might, might be, whatever area that might be. And, and so that's, you know, that's a harsh reality that we all have to, to, have, to f have to face. And when we talk about skill shortages... Uh, particularly in that security space, it, it, it's not a view that I subscribe to. I don't believe there is a skill shortage. Mm. I, I believe we haven't yet understood how to attract the right people mm -hmm. into that space. People that perhaps you could train to acquire some of those skills. You can pretty much teach 
a lot of the technical skills that are required. What you can't necessarily teach are some of the social skills, some of the relationship skills, the the real sort of depth of understanding that people need to now have mm -hmm. in order to relate to co-workers or, or uh, customers and and uh, um, and really develop the way in which your business is is going forward. If you think back just a few short years to the role of cybersecurity, um, that wasn't necessarily the case. It was very much more focused on, on the technology elements of it. You're always going to need some of those. But when we talk about skill shortage, it's much broader. You know, it is about how we raise awareness, how we work collaboratively with people, how we train them to uh, uh, use technology appropriately. Those skills are, are very different from uh, from the, the traditional security-based skills that, uh, that, that we so often talk about. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think if you can look at it that way, that gives you a different perspective on, on, on a skill shortage because the pool in which you're now fishing is so much bigger. Sounds like you need to recruit more artists into the cybersecurity space. I think certainly you need to uh, look at how you can attract um, more creatives. Yeah. Uh, I think that... Uh, you know, there is certainly a role for them in, in terms of contributing to the way in which uh, security is perhaps presented in a more palatable way. You know, I often talk about the fact that uh, we, we've reached the point where the user is king. The user determines the way in which they use technology. And, and so if we think about that for a moment, from a security standpoint, we therefore need to provide a means of the user upskilling to get over some of the challenges that we've, that we've faced. You, you can't prevent them from doing things anymore. You have to teach them. Uh, you have to work with them. Mm -hmm. You have to collaborate. And again, you know, we, we need to be thinking more about those sorts of skills and where would they come from. They will come from sales. They will come from marketing. They will come from HR. They will come from legal. They will come from uh, a whole range of different areas that we probably haven't even thought about. And, and yes, you're still going to need some technical skill sets in there as well, but not the majority. Is there still room in the workplace these days for the baby boomer, or is this an all-millennial workplace culture? I think that, um, for me anyway, uh, I, I'm completely uh, open to any individual working in that space, whether they be a baby boomer, a millennial, or, or whatever it might be. That, that, for me, is somewhat irrelevant. What is relevant is whether or not an individual is able to get the most from the opportunity that, that the business is able to present to them and vice versa. The, the longest, really, that the majority of people will be staying in jobs these days is probably two to three years. So if, if you look at it then through that lens, age is an irrelevance. Experience takes on a whole new... Um, importance because you're looking for people who are able to hit the ground running who are able to deliver and that that requires a combination of of skills of experience of um of interest of of energy mm. and that will exist a, a, across a whole range of different uh, different individuals um and, and so i think that very often you know we we perhaps go into too much detail about that, you know, well, millennials are doing this, well, baby boomers are doing that, and so we need to try to mirror the way. Actually, fundamentally, if you look at the way that business operates, that, that it works increasingly off teams, and, and so you need to have this combination within the business. Um, there are huge advantages from having more seasoned people working with more um, younger, less experienced individuals. Mm -hmm. the, the, the way in which they, they skill share uh, is is very very interesting, um, and the benefit to an organisation is uh, is probably very much more than than if you just focus on, you know, a certain uh, subset of, of of the overall um, environment or or, or indeed um, resource pool that's out there. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. What are the skill sets needed to adapt to the speed? and opportunity and promise of technology in a business setting? And who are the people in business who really need to be the most cyber-educated? Well, well, cyber is, is pretty much all-pervasive, uh, and I'm a very firm believer in that. I think that, you know, I very often talk about the day when 
information security or cybersecurity doesn't exist as a separate department because it has been completely integrated across the enterprise. And I think that's still a, a, a goal that I think everybody should aspire to. So in that kind of environment, uh, then certainly individuals are taking on very much more responsibility for being safe within a cyber environment. That means that we have to work much harder and more effectively at raising the levels of awareness around the use of technology. And, and you know, that has to begin in the schools, uh, not just at, uh, at a tertiary educational level, but at a primary educational level, and to work right the way through that, because over a period of time, we will see this evolution. And I think that if we can get it right in those environments, then cybersecurity becomes something that you just do. But we're nowhere near that. And so we still need to be presenting different ways of, of educating uh, our people in how to use the tools that we give them uh, effectively and also to use the tools that they bring themselves effectively. Very many more people are using their own technology to access corporate systems, for instance. Why? Because they happen to prefer using it. And, and actually, why wouldn't you? So again, from the, from the corporate standpoint, it's about how do you then enable that? How do you make sure that you've got the right levels of, of security in place so that you get the benefit of somebody being able to use their own device that they're accustomed to, that they like to use, but you're doing it from a position of understanding that whilst they're operating within a corporate environment, they're also operating in a personal environment. Mm. And, and there is a lot of work that needs to be done in that in, in terms of, you know, education. Um, it also means that people will be using that technology, not just in work, but on the way to work mm -hmm. and in downtime. And so, again, it's about how do you then operate across all of those different, and, and they are very different ways of, of uh, technology use. But... The answer is not to say you can't do it. The answer is to recognize the fact that that is the way that people use it and to try to mirror your, your policies, your processes, your procedures back to, to provide a, a solution to that. There will always be certain elements of a, of a business that are going to be locked down that you can only access in certain ways. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of what businesses do actually is not doesn't need to be in that firmly locked down space. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need to, I think look very hard at the way in which we uh, allow access um, and identification of individuals uh, within the workspace and allow them to have a much more flexible working style. Um, and that will necessarily, I think, mean that they don't necessarily need to be in an office 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What are the risks inherent in businesses employing cyber technology? I think if you look at uh, the, the, the way in which cyber technology has been implemented, there are some organizations out there that have the, the, the good fortune to have been created very recently. So young startups, you know, they, they're able to adapt the way that they operate to take advantage of cloud technology, of mobile devices, of... Um, the, 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 some of the ways in which we've been talking about how people will will work. But there's also a large number of organizations that aren't in that luxurious position and indeed won't be for, for quite some period of time to come. They won't have been able to adapt sufficiently. Mm -hmm. And for them, th that that presents a huge challenge, particularly if you, you, you know, you have to be working, say, in a government-type environment or a, or, or a traditional you know, public service. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't make some of the moves along the way to, to achieve that sort of flexibility that you would see from some of the more agile environments that, that uh, smaller organizations might be able to, to bring to bear. So I think there are a few things that you need to, to be doing. I think that the reality is that most large organizations are operating with or collaborating with or using smaller third parties. Uh, so you can gain some of the benefits of that agility and, uh, and speed. I think larger organizations also need to understand you know, what is important to their, to their business, particularly from an information standpoint in terms of an asset perspective. 
and really need to start looking at how they can um, perhaps enable some of the ways that we've just been talking about that are very different <clears throat> in some of the areas that they that they operate without necessarily jeopardizing the core business. And then it becomes just a process of gradual evolution. I, I don't think that um, we can suddenly sit down and redraw the corporate landscape for, for many of the, of the largest organizations. Mm. Certainly they will be operating with you know, artificial intelligence. They will be operating with, with a, a huge degree of cyber-enabled technology, cloud-based sharing information you know, rapidly, um, virtual reality perhaps in some instances, uh, and, and really I, I think pushing the boundaries of their business with cyber technology. But there are also going to be the standard organizations that just get the job done. Uh, and, and so I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see this, this um, hybrid collection of, of businesses out there that are some trying to adapt to the way in which technology can further enhance their, their outreach and their ability to, to function. Um, others that have got the luxury of ha having been able to create <clears throat> a, a business in line with what's available and then those that are that are in the middle that are trying to make that that migration um, but you know all of them will have some things in common they will all be susceptible to perspectives and views from social media they will all be employing people who are cyber enabled and have certain demands and requirements uh, and they will all be operating in an environment that is very much faster than uh, than the one that uh, they had just yesterday mm. Does being agile, having that increased speed, mean businesses aren't safe? Uh, I know that if we don't protect our critical assets, a cyber criminal can move very rapidly. So does being agile mean that we are putting ourselves more at risk? I don't think so. Not necessarily. I, th I think that, you know, agility is, is very often mistaken for, for, being, for being risky. Mm -hmm. Or careless. Um, or, or careless. That, that isn't the case. Agility is all about how you can respond to either market opportunity uh, or, in your case here, you know, in, in the case of a breach or a, or a cyber criminal um, targeting you, how you respond agilely to that. And I think that that is very much more a, um, something of a state of mind. Certainly you need to have processes and policies in place, but it comes from, again, the, the leadership of an organization that sets the tone for the way in which a business will be run. Um, you know, if you are particularly risk averse, then of course th there will be challenges in how you go about your your processes in order to to get the job done. Uh, if perhaps you are uh, slightly less risk averse, then you might be prepared to let things uh, let things go in in certain areas. You can't determine one approach for any any one organization. Uh, they will all come to it from different perspectives. They will all have different risk appetites. Uh, they all recognize that, of course, in an environment where um, cyber is it allows for a much higher speed of interaction with the customer base and, and, and indeed with employees and, and, uh, and shareholders, that somehow the organization needs to reflect that. And I think they will then land on which pieces are able to to respond in uh, in, in perhaps a more agile way than 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 others. Um, but agility is is something that you actually embed in an organisation, and it's embedded in the people, and it's it it reflects its way in, in in all sorts of different manifestations. So flexibility, the way in which perhaps you're prepared to, um, you know, work with a, a particular client or a particular situation in order to resolve something. That for me is is agility, and I think that people very often drop into, you know, thinking about it in, um, in in a sort of agile software development type environment. But but agility for me is much more about how you can um, really turn turn an organisation to respond to the to what's going on in in, in the environment. And as I say, um, cyber allows for you to to be picking up all sorts of different in, inputs and insights on an ongoing basis as to how you're being received in the marketplace and indeed how your people are, are, are you know, really working with you and, uh, and, and 
are viewing the job that you're trying to do. Hmm. Well, Steve, always an interesting conversation. Thank you for walking us through these issues today. We know that technology necessitates transformation and that the principles of slow, measured change and a siloed approach, at one time the only real possibility of making progress in business, are being radically altered by advances in not just technology but in business culture. These cultural shifts include increasing business agility, shared information rather than centralized data, collaboration rather than a traditional triangle-type hierarchy, and empowering one's team to make decisions rather than exerting control over your talent. For more information about how ISF products and services can help you manage cybersecurity in your business enterprise, visit securityforum.org.